I just wanted to share a little trick um, with Docker files um, if, to help speed up builds. So what you can do, as long as you're using the um, up-to-date Docker with build X, is you can use uh, cache mounts. And so you can see here, I have a mount type uh, with a cache, and then I target the dependencies folder, and build. And what this will do is it will persist that compiled build from previous um, runs, and then that way it uses every single dep um, on every build. Um, so I had here, I was kind of running this before, this is a smaller project, so um, without any caching, it was 140 seconds to run. Um, it took 28 This internet. Um, so usually it's much faster than that. Usually it's like 10 seconds when I'm at home. Um, at my work, uh, we use the same thing, and those builds were used to like be six to eight minutes. Now those are taking like 30 seconds. Um, if you are gonna use this, a couple of caveats. It does have to run on the same build machine, which is are stored in the Docker directory. I have unfortunately not been able to get this to run in GitHub Actions, as um, this is not something that's really simple to cache across builds. So you usually have to set up uh, like your own hosted runner for this. Um, yeah, so I think that's all I have. He has questions. All right, so this pirate emoji is the title of my talk. I've got a disclaimer. The views expressed in this lightning talk are not that, are that of the speaker and do not represent the views of the US government, DOD, or the United States Navy. Uh, show of hands, uh, how many people have tried to deploy Livebook and or use Livebook and have had trouble? One, oh, two, three, four, five-ish. Okay, well, maybe this is for you. So, oh, actually, I'm going to go switch. Oops. So, yeah, so uh, note the URL on this, localhost 4000 slash livebook. This is not running livebook. And we can go ahead and do this, and it works. How is this accomplished? There is a live session with the livebook route sitting in here. Or there's a scope with a live book uh, route sitting in here. All right, so that's my demonstration. This whole thing was spurred by uh, Jose, who said I should fork it. Challenge accepted. I wouldn't be a pirate if I didn't ask for booty. I don't need this. Some of you do. I'm holding this code ransom. If you want this, contribute to this uh, Indiegogo. That's all I got. Hello, I'm Paulo Valente. I'm from Dockyard. And I'm going to defend myself a bit, because I put up HSAI that's not too good. But I'm going to show you why it can be better with the same structure. So uh, if anyone has opened the, the Elixir.com chess app, that we put up with Live on Native, you can see that you can play with uh, against an X, and then an X plays some dumb moves. <laughs> but here's the thing: we have this structure where, for each current board, we predict the possible moves and apply mini the minimax algorithm on them. And for each leaf node, we'll apply the evaluation, and then do the minimax to decide what's the best move for us to play. So uh, you can find the code at uh, the, the ElixirConf chess repository. And I'm going to put up this live book at my personal GitHub. And the prediction model is just an Excel model that I built uh, based on some ideas that Lila Chess Zero uses. But instead of ch training with reinforcement learning, uh, I did just supervised learning. And the representation that I use is an 8 by 8 by 12. And part of the problem is the, this by 12 representation, because it's six pieces. It's six kinds of pieces for white, so pawn, rook, knight, bishop, queen, and the king. And the same for black, so that's 12. But this doesn't capture who's currently playing, if the current, per, current player is in check, and so on. So this is part of why the 
model isn't that great. And this outputs uh, a prediction of, of length 4096, which is basically 64 times 64. So the probability of moving one piece for a given square to, to another square. And we just filtered that out to only predict on valid moves. And this general idea would work if we, we chose a better representation for the input and used more, uh, a more complex network, as I did at home, but we were resource constrained to only run all the CPU, so I ended up not using this newer version. And the evaluation model follows the same idea, but instead of outputting like 4,096 entries, we just output a single number, which is bounded between minus 20 and 20, which is the evaluation for the current, current board. So you can evaluate if black is better or white is better. And after that, we can apply minimax, and we can basically configure the depth of the, the analysis, as well as how many moves per depth we analyze. So that, that's where the predict, prediction model can, comes in. So we can take like the top, top five most probable moves and analyze those instead of analyzing like the 200 valid moves that can probably happen there. And then you analyze in depth. And there's something that I didn't mention here, but there's alpha beta pruning as well. So you analyze at most uh, the whole tree, but you can, in general, analyze less than the tree. So that's why we can run on the CPU. Um, and yeah, so yes, the AI plays badly, but this was basically uh, Carson building the app one month ago and me having to learn about how we could build in HSAI and then actually doing it. And the deployment had resource computational resource constraints. And the idea is that you can replace the prediction model as well as the evaluator model and tune a bit of the minimax parameters and get a, a whole lot better HSAI. And that's that for me. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about how is it is implementing multi-tenancy in Ecto. Uh, my name is Jin gyu Son, and I'm a co-organizer of LX Korea and Seoul LX Meetup. So in Korea, the popularity of LX continues to rise. Just two years ago, we were wondering if, if even five people would show up, but now we have around 30 attendees. So returning to the main topic, what is multi-tenancy? When it does, it's often helpful to start by looking at the opposite concept. So then what is single tenancy? In single tenancy, a single instance of the software serves a single customer. Then what is multi-tenancy? When a single instance of software application serves multiple customers, it is referred to as multi-tenancy. So why do we need multi-tenancy? Uh, it's more cost-effective and easier to deploy and operate than single tenancy. However, multi-tenancy has several cons. Multi-tenancy increases uh, security concerns, especially risk of data breaches, and it has the noisy neighborhood issue, and it's more complex to implement, and it becomes more challenging to offer flexibility in features for each tenancy. Within the realm of database, there are three main approaches to implementing multi-tenancy. Uh, the higher up the list, the more difficult it is to implement, but it also trend, uh, tends to be more secure. In Elixir, Ecto makes it remarkably easy to implement multi-tenancy. Ecto addresses two of these issues. So Ecto supports the implementation of separate database per tenant through dynamic repo, and separate schema per tenant through multi-tenancy with uh, query prefix, and shared schema for tenant through multi-tenancy with foreign keys. All the guidelines for these methods are sh uh, super well documented in the Ecto documentation. This is considerably easier compared to uh, other languages or libraries. 
So uh, let's take a closer look at the ages among these uh, multi-tenancy with foreign keys. Actor repo has a uh, pre-query callback, which allows us to modify the query or options before executing the query. In this case, uh, if the options contain skip organ, organ ID or schema migration, it simply proceeds without making changes. If there is an organ ID option, it adds a where condition to the query for the specific uh, organ ID. If neither is present, it raises an error, assuming a coding mistake was made. Uh, with this setup, we can execute a, a query like the one below. Uh, with the orga ID option is uh, to apply a where condition, fetching users based on the, uh, that orga ID. So far, it might not seem straightforward yet. Now, let's create a, create a, a MyApp tenant module and let it store the orga ID in the process. Put orga ID in the process allows us to retrieve and use it from anywhere within the same process. Within this setup, we can put the org ID in one part of your code and then get it uh, another code. Up to this point, it's still not quite straightforward. Let's implement the default option callback in my app repo module we worked on earlier. This default option uh, call, uh, callback is invoked before prepare query and it sets the default value for options. Uh, here, we will always fetch the org ID from the process for use. So when you put the org ID in the process somewhere in your code, any query executed uh, within the same process will automatically apply a where condition based on the, uh, that org ID. If by chance you forget to put the org ID, the prepare query will raise an error. So you can use it with peace of mind. Now it's just straightforward, isn't it? So, and lastly, if you are using live view, you can utilize a hook to always fetch the org ID from the session and put it into the process. Uh, doing this ensures that all query calls from incoming requests are securely handled in multi-tenancy environment. All of this can be applied throughout the entire application with less than five, uh, 50 lines of code changes. In this way, using Ecto, we can prevent security issues in a uh, multi-tenancy environment. And moreover, such an implementation is uh, no longer complex. Yes, Alex can. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so my name is Dewey Garwood. I'm a freelance engineer. I've been working on Elixir in about five years. And uh, some of you may recognize this title because I gave it last year. But last time, we did not have examples in Elixir, which I'll show this time around. Um, basic premise is that testing is hard. And we see that because of the time-consuming effort. It's something that tends to be skipped when we're pressed for time, and it's also something that is usually the last thing taught in tutorials, but doesn't have to be that way. Um, the premise of outside-in development is that we use test-first development within scoped testing context to define what we're going to build before we fully understand what the system is. And those testing contexts are what's important. Um, and when we consider testing something, we have various pieces in our application stack that we need to work with, right? A feature test is usually the user interacting with the browser. Request specs are our API layer as requests come into our server. Context, um, unfortunately, I think is uh, becoming a little overloaded, but it's uh, like the last talk um, that was in this room. Context are the business logic, the business domain, schema is interacting with the database, and then the view is how we render that out to the browser. And so if we look at um, these different contexts, right, this is kind of what we would be using them for, what we're trying to test. And I have a little bit to show you. So this particular test, is are we able, able to read that? Is that good? Um, this is a Wallaby test, feature spec, uh, and you'll notice that the very first one there, this is based on the, uh, the Phoenix tutorial for 
uh, the Hello app and the Phoenix guides. The first feature, list products by default, is uh, actually fairly simple, and it just visits the root path. Um, if you were to look at the uh, Phoenix, what you end up with from the, um, let me make sure that's running. Um, All right, so if we go and look at what you end up with from the tutorial, oh, come on, 4001, this is what you get. All the tests from the tutorial pass, but if I was a user hitting this website, I wouldn't know where to go. I wouldn't have anything to interact with. If we go to the products, then we actually get the application that we've built in that tutorial. Um, the point being that a user does not navigate your application this way. They don't take your, uh, each page and put that in the, U the URL for the browser to get where they're trying to go. What they're going to do is they're going to come into the root path, and then they're going to navigate, kind of like I have in the, the second test down there for admin. They're going to navigate somewhere in your application using links that are on the page. Um, and you'll notice that this second test here is um, pretty generic, right? The, the tasks that are here are a summary of what a user is going to do. As far as all the specifics, that are done to interact with the application, that's something that's down here in a separate uh, method. This allows us to pull out all the specific things that need to be done and be succinct about what it is we're actually trying to accomplish with the test. Um, so that feature, right, allows us to start from the user's perspective and stay in the user's context. And you'll notice that line 17 there, the confirmation is in the browser. I'm not going to go into the database because if a user is going to interact with your website and then check that the result they submitted shows up in your database by logging into your database, your security team needs to be fired and you should hire that user as a developer because they can get into something that they shouldn't have access to, right? So that's the general idea. And if you'd like more details, come see me later. My title is uh, Pyramid Backend, a uh, memory saving fault tolerant and distributed collection of Linux compilers and backends for embedded systems. My name is Susumu Yamazaki, call me Zaki. Um, the, this slide is uh, uh, in my speaker deck. Uh, from, I'm from Japan, an organizer, Elsa Kong JP, and an associate professor at the University of Kitakyushu. My hobby in my childhood was uh, to describe science fiction stories. I wanted to write longer stories like Perry Rodan, but uh, my advantage was to write shorter stories. Uh, you know uh, the de facto standard uh, frameworks of my machine learning for Elixir are NX, Axon, and their ecosystem. The talk by Sin Moriarty uh, at uh, this Elixir conf showed uh, the positioning strategy of MLOps uh, towards distributed and parallel computing with multiple GPUs for LLMs. But we are quite uh, much uh, inspired by his talk. But however, uh, current focuses of NX Axon and their ecosystem, especially EXLA, uh, is, uh, is unsuitable for most of, uh, embedded systems due to lack of GPUs. So we have been developing a pyramid backend, a light, uh, lightweight NX backend specialized for embedded systems since 2022. Uh, our positioning strategy is here. 
uh, we developed the Peruvian backend first edition in 2022. Uh, this provides uh, prob uh, util utilization of OpenBRAS as an NX backend. BRAS means basic linear algebra subroutines, which has been uh, developed and sophisticated since the Fortran era. OpenBRAS is an op open source software compatible with BRAS and has faster implementation with SIMD or vector instructions for most instruction set architectures, including ARM and RISC-V than that written in C. Uh, we implemented a partial builder uh, that co can compile only necessary modules of OpenBRAS and a prototype backend using it. Next, we have developed the Pyramid Backend Second Edition since 2023. One of its concepts uh, is a component based for maintainability based on aspect oriented programming. That is, we will develop the uh, backend generator to de decorate the specified based backend with uh, the functions before and after a set of functions uh, in the backend. The set can be specified with the style of aspect J and with grouping uh, written in hex docs of the NX, for example, uh, aggregates, backend conversions, and so on. The another um, is memory saving. We proved that converting all NX for ResNet to Axon and loading it requires nine gigabyte memory. That is too much to execute them on embedded systems. However, uh, the, the scenes doc show uh, the roadmap to realize memory saving processing for LLM. Then we will wait for the realization. Thus, now we will focus on implementation of the component-based architecture with OpenBRAS. Some module focuses on only multiplication of matrix and matrix, and so on. Uh, other unfre unfrequent operations are delegated to the default backend. Such many simple modules collaborate to operate given numerical functions. This makes architecture simpler to make maintain the monolith. This approach is to accumulate shorter stories towards a longer and longer story. Uh, to get a source of pyramid backend is here. Uh, look forward to uh, our future progress of such accumulated stories. Thank you. Hi, I'm Justin. I'm a co-organizer of the Austin Elixir Meetup and co-founder of Cast Magic. We're a, we're a voice first AI content workspace for creators and businesses. Um, we're a full Elixir live view application, so there's a lot of interesting code we could go into. But today I want to talk about one particular UX issue we solved with OTP for our deployments. So real quick, what happens when your app shuts down? First, we receive a SIG term. Children of your supervision tree are stopped in reverse order. And your endpoint, when its, it's, when its turn comes up, it drains existing socket connections. And for us, being an audio workspace, it's a problem if someone's uploading a two, three hour audio clip and suddenly your live view reboots and you lose that progress. And this is what that looks like. So files loading, deploy happens, and suddenly you see the can't reconnect bubble and you have to restart. So how do we solve this? So we can create a gen server, and what we do is, you know, the implementation isn't fully here, but what you do is you have a gen server that keeps track of live views that are in progress or doing something, and you add this to your supervision tree right in front of your endpoint. And so with this gen server, you can implement a way where it will wait for live views that are uploading or doing some kind of work to finish before it actually continues with, with the shutdown. And we can implement a, a custom timeout for this. And you can see on the left, the live views decide when it should hold and when it should release, in this case, when the, when the upload is done. Um, and this was something we figured out, or I figured out uh, with the help of Chris from the, the community Slack. Um, it's always great to have help from there. And it ended up being contributed to 
Thousand Island, or ended up leading to a contribution in Thousand Island that then enabled this kind of feature in that server as well. Um, and the takeaway here is that web sockets and deployments are tough in any language, but in Elixir, it's easy and or at least bearable. Um, and if you scan the QR code, it'll take you to a gist with the full implementation of what this looks like. Um, and yeah, it's been working in our application for a few months now, and the complaints have definitely gone down. Thank you. Uh, howdy. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to talk about raw water for whenever you want to implement SQL injection in your Elixir apps. Uh, so Vito's a nom de plume. You've probably talked to me using my you know, regular name. Uh, and I'm really sorry, Hot Dog Stand is actually the only keynote theme I have installed. I deleted all the default ones and lie on microphone every now and then. Uh, so I run security capture the flag contests. Uh, and they basically boil down to trying to get secrets out of computer programs. Uh, I've run the DEF CON capture the flag uh, for you know, several years on and off. We have free qualifiers coming up for next year's in the spring. You can check out nautilus.institute if you want to learn more. Uh, they're really, really fun. People get like super into them. On the left, at the uh, Hackasack contest at DEF CON, you see the Italian team Macaroni finding out that they won. Uh, they'd actually, like, I thought they'd like given up and gone you know, away Saturday night, but Sunday they're you know, tackling each other in joy. Uh, at the bottom right, there's one with a lot of decoration. At the top right is one without a lot of decoration. So in all the groups I've been in, we tend to do a lot of binary challenges, and it's like a self-reinforcing thing. Uh, more people do binary challenges because we get more practice doing binary challenges. And we would like to do more different kinds of challenge. Uh, websites are a kind of challenge. The problem is like web challenges often turn into like a SQL injection challenge or some other kind of like CWE94 code data injection. Uh, don't get me started about like how CWE keeps changing the names. But the problem with SQL injection is there's a tool called SQL map. And the problem with SQL map is it like will read HTML, it'll like go to a website and it'll figure out which fields on the website are SQL injectable and then it'll use that and do like repeated injection attacks and eventually like enumerate every single row in every single table in the database. Uh, now that you know this, please be responsible. Uh, so the nice thing about Phoenix Live View is SQL map is just like parsing HTML and making HDUB requests. It's not like puppeting a full browser. Uh, because uh, I'm a bad person and I don't care about like accessibility for some of these CTF challenges, uh, and players can always like puppet a real browser, uh, LiveView solves this. <clears throat> the other problem with SQL injection challenges is this is a computer hacking contest which incentivizes mischief, and this means that players on different teams are like incentivized to like cause problems for other teams. So we want to avoid that with like a, a multi-tenement setup. Uh, so let's talk about the XQLite library. It's really good. It's SQLite 3 for Elixir. And you can make an in-memory database using the file name colon memory colon. And then you can turn that database into just like an Elixir binary. And then you can like take that binary later, load it back into SQLite 3 uh, by opening a blank memory database and then deserializing into it. So I made this tool or this, you know, I guess module called Minibase. So teams each get their own private SQLite database to inject and make a huge mess into, and then I serialize it and I save it into Postgres. Uh, many people told me this is terrible. <laughs> so I used Ecto for the Postgres stuff because I want it safe, and the you know, mix phx.gen.live you know, just kind of did that for me, and it's like, cool. Uh, and for the XQLite, I interpolate the string for the party field that is injectable, and the regular fields that aren't injectable uh, don't get interpolated and get bound parameters instead using this uh, horrible code. Um, so the party field and the other field, that alludes to the existence of a hell form. Uh, so whenever players connect, they get, you know, 10, they get a product, they, you know, go to the order form, they fill out 10 fields, hit order, and then it says, okay, you're on page two of 10. Uh, so each team gets their own private form with a bunch of randomly generated form fields. Uh, about 50% of them are mandatory fields. Exactly one is vulnerable to SQL injection, and exactly one will reject your form if you put a single quote in it, like you need to do to do SQL injection. So uh, once players have logged in, they see this product listing all these different kinds of raw water. Uh, so we're going to buy the water from under the iguana tree. So, you know, we're on the buy it now form. We have, you know, 
uh, we were like in a rush and we used Bing Image Generator to make these you know, product IDs. So here's page one of the form. I'm just trying to like burn through it. Uh, I'm putting in X in every field. Uh, that's not supposed to be there. Uh, so on page seven, I found out using the automated solver I wrote to test this, that you know, the spouse car model field is injectable. And then I place the order and it says, okay, I ordered the iguana water, all these fields are X. And way down there inside the you know, spouse car model is the flag that we've now captured. And the SQL that turned into is this awful thing. There's like the product ID, all the randomly generated you know, columns, all the you know, question marks to where you, uh, you know, the bound parameters get interpolated like you know, reasonable adults do with SQL. Uh, and then the one parameter that's not bound and uh, you know, does string, uh, you know, grabs the flag from another table and puts it right in the same string. So the, uh, the mini base stuff is intended to be reusable. The Helm form stuff, you know, it's kind of played out. Uh, if you want to use that, let me know. Uh, I can absolutely help you. I'm a veto at nautilus.institute. Uh, this is MIT licensed open source stuff. Uh, there's like ticket stuff that you may want to yank. Uh, but thank you, the uh, source is up on GitHub. Uh, you can hit me up on Mastodon, uh, hackers.town slash at veto. That's the big QR code there. Uh, this presentation is already up on Speaker Deck. I'm Vito at Nautilus.Institute. And if you like this keynote theme, uh, you can have it. Hi, so I'm Michael, and uh, I've been chatting with a lot of people. Uh, before Elixir Conf, I got to look at the Elixir source code uh, and play around with it for the first time. I mean, like, I've worked with Elixir, but I got to mess with the Elixir Lang source code on GitHub because I wanted to sort autocomplete from IEX, and uh, that's for another talk, but uh, <laughs> I, so I, I actually got it to work, and I wanted to sort it by arity, and then a friend of mine said, hey, um, what happens when you go above 10? And you know, he was pointing out that on like a Mac operating system, it uses a lexicographical sort, and it turns out that was the case. So these are like feedbacks I've gotten as I've talked about. Um, the thing that I found, which some people are like, but why, this is silly, uh, but it's an Elixir bug, but is it an Elixir bug? It, is it working as expected? Uh, and then like breaking news, you know, like a pun, you know, so I wanted this like a news bulletin. Um, okay, so like let's look at what is going on. So let's say I have an example project that has a hello function, and I really like to use the hello function, and I, um, you know, I have an arity of 18, but it's not at the end, it's in the middle. And okay, so let me try to sort by arity. Um, well, actually, let's show how you make the bug. So you create a new <laughs> mix project, and it generates a hello world for you. So just add arity, and <laughs> we're, we're good to see the bug. Cool. OK, so then like this is what it looks like when you start trying to IO inspect as you're doing autocomplete with IEX. So you can see that it autocompleted the um, the term, and it gave uh, uh, like a tuple, or, uh, and um, yeah, well, and so like basically I'm IO inspecting higher up and then higher up, and at the end of the line we get a, a list of character strings, and then we look at the output that we get, and so we see at that moment everything's sorted as we expect, but then when we see the output that we get, the 18 is still in the middle. So I came to the conclusion that uh, the, uh, there's a shell.erlang that IEX communicates to, and whether that does its own sort or not, uh, the operating system might be doing a lexicographical sort. So uh, the operating system example of a lexicographical sort is how like, when you look at files, it, it shows like file 11 in the middle. And um, yeah, that's like the little fun thing I wanted to chat about. Uh, and um, 
this is my Twitter QR code, and then the project is uh, on GitHub, and there's a uh, a full write-up on like potential solutions to the problem. Like uh, with your operating system, there's this LC collate uh, config you can set that I was looking at to change the default. So uh, I, I have like two PRs that I've got in the works, but uh, I don't have high confidence any of it's going to get merged because why add to the surface area and you know, <laughs> you know it's fine I guess, but it's just a fun thing to chat about. Thank you. Hey y'all. Uh, so now I'm here to talk about code review. Uh, I am Eleni. I'm, uh, this is an important link. Like, if you'd like to see this recipe I use for code review, uh, the speaker deck has my slides there. There's a lot of cool reference here uh, about code review. And I'm the same person that was talking about cold smells. Um, cool. So, but now I'm here to talk about code review in a very quick version. So. Remind about saving the, the, link, the that link for the slides. So I I, was, uh, I, I always like to see the reference uh, in the like uh, scientific papers about uh, the topic I'm talking about. And this one is cool. Like uh, when we are talking about code review, uh, is the process that catch 60% of the defects. Uh, and the types of defects is the interesting part. Part like uh, we are talking about not bugs, but about evolvability evo defects that are not detectable during the testing phase. So it's a good opportunity to, to catch the codes, the code smells and proposing refactorings. This is the connection. Uh, and review is cheaper. Uh, like if you catch uh, error or like a, a improvement that could be done in the review part, it's cheaper than catch it like a bug or an issue in production. So. This is the part I kind of skip. Uh, this is like when I am an author of a uh, pull request, I try to make uh, this, um, I have a good title, showing the motivation, list previous discussions, things like that. Uh, try to make small changes, always good to reviewers, uh, having tests. Uh, what else? Uh, this one is cool, like I, I like to review my own PR. This is a practice that other people uh, that I know, uh, that I work with uh, has also. Uh, respond to all the comments, and I, I really enjoyed this talk about uh, um, think of, uh, what you are capturing when we are doing some like when you are creating PR, like doing some changes. Try to capture the why, not the what. Uh, and now, the, like the other side, as a reviewer, things that I I need to I, I try to think about, like try to identify bugs, uh, proposing refactors, connection with my previous talk. Uh, reinforcing pa patterns, um, think about security, documentation, and this is the cool part, like when we are new in a company, when we are like, when we don't have enough context about something, it's a good opportunity to uh, be introduced to new fe features like functionalities, learning new technologies, opportunity to share knowledge and questions. And this is like the cool part that I want to talk about. Uh, when we think about feedback in code review, it should be about the source code, not about the people. Uh, and it, I think another thing is like trying to promote pers the participation of everyone. Everyone has something to contribute, even like about a part of the code that is not clear enough, su suggesting some refactoring, some renaming, documentation. And this is like the, the, the hidden part of this whole process about communication. Um, it might, uh, in the cold review, we might have some toxic behaviors, like the might not that, that may, may not not, oh, sorry. They, they may not be that clear, like not obvious. So it's a good opportunity to ask for feedback, read about nonviolent communication. This is another cool book to, to read about. Uh, and some quick ex examples, uh, like you, rec you receive a request change and say, Insane, like should not be merged this PR, and and this is like just opinion-based comment, lacking the concrete actions, is imperative or you agree or not. So if you want to request change, please provide the reason and the actions to to resolve that is a good practice. Uh, this is uh, this is the I think the, the slide that I want to show more like 
uh, a comment like this. Why haven't you created a new module? Uh, it may sound like trivial, not uh, wrong, but there's a ju judgmental tone like, why did you think, uh, why did you think of, of that? Uh, and this is like another reference, uh, another cool link for talking about, uh, to see like uh, how to do code reviews like human. <laughs> and uh, this is super cool, um, please get the link there. Uh, this is about like trying to comment in a more constructive manner. Uh, so instead of saying that with this uh, in place, like the between lines saying, uh, uh, why did you think about of that? Try to say like, what do you think about uh, what do you think about extracting this logic into a module? I think it will be it will improve readability and reduce complexity. Uh, you are trying to uh, suggest something, uh, not, not as uh, uh, and like reasoning about why. Uh, another version without the assumptions, like I don't know if you already uh, considered this, but would it worth it create a new module for this case? Like the no assumption part, this is just a suggestion. They are good things. Uh, this is how to talk about the unconscious bias. This is uh, things that sometimes happen and we don't notice. Uh, one here, an example about seniority bias, when we uh, have some comment like explain to a junior engineer everything, everything like, Oh, you ask something about the the business, and then you describe a huge text about that. Uh, so my my advice here is like not assuming this is a, uh, that a junior needs an explanation for everything. And this other is about gender bias. This is something that I I noticed a couple of times. Don't try to explain what is Elixir is to a female engineer. Elixir engineer, it's, it, it, it's fun, but it's hard. Like. <laughs> It's something that sometimes happens. Sometimes I receive some link from the official documentation, like, um, oh. Uh, and this is another thing, like, combine those bias. Pay attention for not assuming a female engineer is always a junior. <laughs> sometimes you, yeah, I notice, like, these two bias, like, oh, the gender and the senior, oh, okay. <laughs> it's happened, but that's all. This is all. I need to share this. Uh, Cool links about the nonviolent communication, uh, about again the programmer's brain. I love this book. Uh, Main explaining things for me. I have this ebook here about, uh, the, like, this is like the longest version of this talk. Uh, and a bunch of articles that are super cool about code review in general. And just advocating for more groups to support f more female engineers in this area. This is the Rails Girl version, like the Rails version. Uh, I really want to have one for Elixir. This is my version for a uh, project in Portuguese. And in Portuguese, we say Elixir Lab, not Elixir Lab. <laughs> uh, and this is like just a um, kind of a um, book club about Elixir and reviewing and generating content in Portuguese. This is just a fun project. That's all. And there's the link for the slides again. Thank you so much. I want to talk today about uh, how to this uh, how to guide a junior engineer as a, someone who just dropped their junior title. Uh, hello, I'm Kate Rosenis, and I work with SimpleBet. We provide the odds for in-play betting to sports betting companies like DraftKings, FanDuel. We use LiveView, so if you're looking for a job, you might want to check out our job listings. You can scan that QR code if if you want. Let, uh, Last I checked, we have an opening for Elixir software engineer. So um, I've been here a year and a half now, and they treat me really well. So check it out. Um, so the first time I ever did a talk, I was a child. Uh, at least I was 15, and I looked like a child. <laughs> I was at RubyConf, and I discussed how my parents got me programming, how they got me interested in programming. I actually met the guy who created the curriculum I used then, Code Academy, he's here. I was psyched. Um, the next lightning talk was two years ago in Austin at Elixir Comp. I just graduated college and I was doing an internship in my mother's basement. I, I shared, um, uh, 
I shared how I was bootstrapping with Phoenix Live U to get a job and helpful tools, et cetera. Like, there was a lot, so I'm happy to talk about that if you want to know what I did. Last year, I think, I think I did a lightning talk. I cannot, for the life of me, remember, and I did not have time to look it up because I started writing this like an hour ago. So, <laughs> this year, I've been a year and a half into my career, and I would like to share some helpful tips for guidance for junior year engineers, um, things that really helped me. And just know that this is highly biased. Like, this is just things that helped me. Um, this is about as far as I got writing my presentation because I thought there was going to be like 20 people that went up before I did. So uh, this is not foreshadowing on the talk I have with my mom tomorrow. There was a lot more prep preparation that went into that. Um, OK, so number one is to make the junior drive almost daily. Um, the guy I worked with the most my first few months made me drive every time. Question and I hated it. It was the worst. I was so uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable with my environment setup, and he made me, he just, he's, he was, he said, You have a question? Okay, let me see your screen. And I was like a really slow typer, and I didn't have, didn't have, um, I didn't know any shortcuts, like absolutely none other than copy and paste. Uh, you'd think, you'd think you'd learn these in college, right? Um, and then this one, would probably make you uncomfortable, but sometimes, sometimes people held my hand. That was a very few times, and it was, am I going in and out? Okay, we talked about making them drive regularly. All right, now holding their hand. Um, so the thing about holding their hand is you don't have to do it every day. I had one pairing session with this guy, and, um, this was one of the most beneficial pairing sessions I ever had. He showed me how he set up his developmental environment and then held my hand while installing a database client, PostEco, a text, edit, text editor shortcuts, and plugins to make my command line prompt uh, reflect my Git status. There was just, there was a bunch of things and he was like, there helping me download the things. And people had told me to do these things in the past, but I did not know how to prioritize them or whatever. So he held my hand through that, and my like ease of development was just smooth. And I helped, I did that for somebody else, and I will continue doing that for people because they only need it once, and then they're good. It's not like you're gonna be like telling them again and again. All right, I'm not gonna rabbit trail on that. And then feedback. Whether it's good, good feedback is great. I remember one time I started using option and then like if you go into your command line, you have like a few words and then you can do option and then arrow. Uh, it's okay, ready? No. No ready. You can do option arrow and it's gonna skip the word. And we were pairing and it made the pairing session like faster and my manager was like, oh my gosh, you're so much faster now, that's great. And I blushed, I was like so flushed. And it was the most simplest shortcut but it made me so happy because he was my boss and I was doing a good job. <laughs> um, that, wait. Yeah, that's, that's about all I got for now because that's as far as I got writing this. But um, yeah, I wanted to emphasize holding their hand because there's just been a few times that someone just walked me through something step by step, helped me write the code, and I never had to do with them again. So that's the end. Come to my mother and I's talk tomorrow. So I'm gonna run through this fast because I know we're already over time. This is uh, about lightning fast uh, dev tools, and this isn't about the dev tools actually being fast, it's about getting it through the process and getting it out into production so that we could be using them. The problem was that we had was that some of the team, some of our, our team at dscout, were manually deleting and updating the database to reset certain values in order to test and develop against certain flows that we had. 
So we're in the midst of a large refactor, as everyone always is. Once you get like three years in, everyone's always refactoring all the time. And so the data model is changing. And what happened was we released a change to the data model. Um, our front end and uh, client devs didn't know about that. And QA didn't know about that. And so a bunch of people lost like a day of time trying to figure out what happened. That's very expensive. And so I didn't want the um, front-end developers and also our QA people to have to worry about all the internals of what we're doing. So the solution was to try and create some dev tools that would support the most common data reset flows and add test coverage to those so that we would know that they are working for people as we change the data model. The challenge was that security-wise, trying to open up maybe a route or put a new live view in, you're going to get a lot of pushback on that as you're heading towards certain deliveries because people want to evaluate the security of it or this, that, and the other thing. And that environments, we didn't want this in prod. We didn't want them to be able to go out and manually uh, hand jam prod or anything like that. We wanted to be able to make sure it was only staging, local, and in test. So the implementation that, where's Bernheisel? Was he here? David, Dave and I talked about this, and, and I'm going to give him credit for it, although I think I just irritate the crap out of him all the time. So um, the implementation was to create a module with the dev tools in it, and then I was like, let's just have him spin up IEX and just do it, execute it right there. And that's great. It's easy. It's available locally, but it's not in staging. But we already had Oban in our stack because we work with Parker. So Oban's already out in staging. So it, I was thinking, well, if we can just throw an access layer in Oban, then bam, we'll have dev tools out. So this is kind of like the, the idea that I had is that you have a user that wants to ex execute some dev tool function. They're going to hit some kind of access layer, and they're going to get the dev tool tools. Now, that access layer, I don't care if it's IAX. I don't care if it's open. I don't care if it's live view. Don't care as long as it's available to them. So I ended up writing this module, this dev tools module. And so I was very careful. People that weren't Elixir developers were going to have to use this. And so I wanted to make sure that they could get the documentation if they wanted to. So I tried to fully dock this module. And I'm kind of going to scroll through this. I'll post the link some, somewhere because I've got this whole thing documented. But basically, I, I add a lot of documentation to the module. And you'll see that I have these functions down here. I actually have a list function so they can actually see if like, maybe the dev tools have changed. Maybe there's a functions back there. But this is just an example of one, reset a new user flow. Like, you know, where you're creating a new user and you need to reset it so you can do it again. So we're going to do amazing things in there. The internals of the code don't matter. The idea is that this is doing important things that make it faster for people that are developing or testing. And this was the key. In staging, we had Oban available, but we didn't necessarily have IEX available for people to reach into staging. So I'm like, you know, we just throw an Oban worker in there and then just give them the function name make them pass in the parameters, transfer that to DevTools, and voila, this thing took less than 48 hours to ship. And whenever you can solve someone's pain point after they lost a day, like, like if you have five, six people losing a day of time for testing and you can solve that in 48 hours, I don't know, as a developer, it feels amazing. But if you open this up in IEX, because the documentation has been added, this is what you get. So for all of our developers that were front-enders who hadn't necessarily been with El Elixir, they open this up, and if you just put H DevTools in there, it will spit out all the module doc. And so it kind of helps them figure out how to use this stuff. And so then um, and you can just run the functions from there. But if anyone's looking for ways to support other developers and make sure they have the tools available to reset environments or data, this is a great option and fast shippable because Oban was already in prod. Thanks.